Jordan, it's you're in Sydney. You've arrived. How are you feeling? I feel pretty good. You feel pretty good. Yeah. I got here yesterday morning, yeah. pretty early, but it's all good, you know. Yeah. It's, it's all good. Yeah. So we're what four or five days before this kind of big, glitzy, glamorous, exciting, huge event. Um, yeah. You know, this event about essentially storytelling that that you created, and it's such a remarkable thing given. You know, especially given the, the context of your story as well. Um, so maybe I wanted to just start at the beginning and talk a little bit about your your notorious teenage years. Um, did you want to maybe talk a little bit? Yeah, about absolutely. That? I mean, I come from a it sounds kind of cliche. I come from a broken home, which I do. And yeah, my parents split up pretty early, so whatever. I, I my mum was single mum with four kids, all very close together. Kind of chaos. Yeah. She had her issues, frankly. Wonderful person. Just had dinner with her, early dinner with her tonight. So <laughs> she's great. She's the best. But you know, she had, she she was an incredibly talented piano player, yeah. as it happens. And as anybody knows who knows someone who's that brilliant, I think baggage comes along with that. My mum had a lot of baggage. Has a lot of baggage. But anyway, so um, I had a pretty tumultuous kind of. Teenage years, I got kicked out of school and yeah. stuff, and burnt a few things down, and it was kind of a nightmare. By the time I was 15, I was out of school, and I was working at a petrol station, yeah. um, and I really just wanted to be a car mechanic. Yeah. And I got, you know, a couple of years later, you know, I was sort of small town crime and stole a few motorbikes and stuff. Yeah. And I got a call from a friend um, who had become an agent. And when I was 17, and she said, you know, I, they, they need me to send someone along for this part from a 17-year-old boy, and I don't know any except you. She's a friend of the family. Yeah. Would you mind going on this audition as a as a favour? And I said, sure. I didn't really know what an audition was. I, hadn't, I mean, I'd done a couple of school plays, but I'd never got through the actual performance because yeah. I got kicked out or whatever. And <laughs> so anyway, I went for this thing, and it turned out it was for a part of a kid who was coming from a broken home and wanted to be a car mechanic. <laughs> and, and I was like, this is perfect, then I got the job. Yeah. So, <laughs> that was like the beginning of it. Um, just a side note, there's a story about you um, putting a teacher's car on the roof of your school. Mm -hmm. I'm, just, I'm just interested about the logistics of that. <laughs> well, you kind of need to know the school, but it's um, very true. Yeah. There's a school called Glen Eyre, and finally my dad sent me to it. Because my dad came back into my life and he uh, realised that there's this diner school in, in um, you know, Middle Cove where they had a policy not to expel anyone. <laughs> so he thought, maybe that's the place for my son. Um, and, it, and it's on a hill, it's in Middle Cove. So there's a driveway that goes right by the roof of the school. And the teacher had a mini monk, you know, yeah. I don't know, you get eight guys together, yeah. you could pick that up. So, anyway, I rewrote the policy at the school, they do actually now expel. I was, I was the first one. Congratulations. So is my little son. Um, I wish I could say that's not true, but it actually is. It's a good story. Yeah. Good one to tell the kids. Or not. Or not. Um, I'm just thinking, if, if you could, you know, talk to yourself now back back then besides the obvious of you know maybe keep your chin up and you know stay out of trouble what what kind of advice would you tell yourself as a I guess 17 year old yeah, that's a great year question year I mean I think just try and be true to yourself and really try and listen to yourself have, have your own voice I mean I don't know if I've got a zinger of an answer for it. it's a great yeah. question but I think um, what I tell a lot of the filmmakers who try to get a trot fest or anybody who asks any advice yeah. is that thing and it takes a huge amount of courage and I won't pretend I've ever really achieved it myself mm -hmm. but to just focus on your own thing yeah. and, and just have the confidence to believe that if it's your true voice 100% then that'll work yeah. you know? and, and, and maybe it will, maybe it won't but at least you were sort of honest about it yeah. I guess that, um, that kind of comes into you know, passion, and you found you were quite lucky that you found you know your passion for for film 
quite early on and, and passion is something that a lot of people struggle with a lot of especially a lot of adults you know struggling to find their passion um, what do you think that people need to know about kind of living living a passionate life and a life with passion well I mean it sort of comes back to the similar question I mean just to be as honest as you can with yeah. yourself and tell your own story yeah. as honestly as, as you can I think passion is a great word for it I mean I did find I mean that did change my life and all my friends I had to say, not all of them, of course, but at that age, the ones that I sort of, when I got that one play that I auditioned for, it was yeah. actually a play. Yeah. It was theatre education, which meant we basically went around to schools and did this play. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd been kicked out of half of the schools, it was kind of funny. <laughs> all the same kids was there, you know, yeah. it was still that age. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it sort of just ignited something in me that was not about destroying something or putting a roof on a car or yeah just gave me something to be passionate about yeah and so so is filmmaking is filmmaking still your passion is it does it is a is film rocking your world or are you at home thinking about you know knitting scarves all day or kind of what there's a little bit of that, little bit of that. <laughs> no i mean definitely obviously with trot fest you know it's changed the course of my life a little bit i mean yeah. i do love filmmaking i i get very excited by great films yeah um you know, so there's, there's no doubt at all that that passion is there. Yeah. But I'm, I'm also sort of, I feel, not to use a big word, but there's an entrepreneurial side that's sort of come about from Trumpets, which is so incredibly exciting to me. Because filmmaking, I feel like, you know, it, it's incredibly hard to make a great film. Yeah. If you can do it, fantastic, Oscars and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But I feel like, and again, not to sound sort of high-minded, but what we're doing with Trumpets is a little bit more... Frankly, it's a bit more groundbreaking. Yeah. I mean, we're making the rules up. Yeah. We're trying to go to countries that you know people don't really have even heard of short films in front of. And we're trying to raise money out of nothing. We've got this incredibly expensive event mm -hmm. that we have to put on. We don't charge the audience to come to it. We're going to sort of think laterally. So I am very, very passionate about that as well. Yeah. And I feel like you know, does the world need another Steven Soderbergh? Mm -hmm. Or does the world, in my opinion, or does the world need a Tropfest? Yeah. I, I think Tropfest. Yeah. You know, Speaking about the, the, the global expansion of, of kind of Chopfest, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, you've got it in India and you've got Chopfest Arabia. What kind of films are you, are you seeing out of there and, and you know, the, the storytelling and the, I guess the human, the human stories that are coming out of the films? Yeah, I mean, it's, they're, you know, so many ways they're all completely different. Yeah. India we don't have, we're in discussions with India, okay. but I'll tell you, the real, the real Chopfest that actually let's say 2013, are happening, already have happened, are Australia, New Zealand, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, um, New York, um, and we're in discussion with India, and China, and, and Israel. Um, but to answer your question, there's so much that's a completely, you know, it's so bizarre to sit there at Tropist Arabia, which takes place in Abu Dhabi, and our third one's coming up, and to go, and the entire night is in Arabic. I mean, so I'm sitting there going, well, I started this thing, I don't understand the word. <laughs> and I recognise the format, and I, and I obviously recognise the films because the films have English subtitles and yeah. I've been part of choosing them. But, so they're so different, and yet, what I find very exciting about it is they're kind of the same. Yeah. I mean, people are thinking about the same things, and you think, you know, especially living in America, there's this, you know, this whole Muslim thing ever since 9-11 and probably decades before where, you know, if you're a Muslim, I mean, I hate to say it, but what you've been told a lot of the time is that suspicious and all this stuff. And you get over there and you go, oh my God, these are the sweetest people I've ever seen in my life. And the stories they're telling about the parents and mum, you know, the kids. And, and, and it sort of sounds obvious, but to see it with your own eyes, um, it's incredibly inspiring. And I feel like in that way, Trop First In is doing its little part, yeah. of bringing people together and yeah. telling these stories. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Um, going back to your directing work and kind of your life outside of Trop First, um, I imagine the industry to be you know, extremely challenging, extremely competitive. How do you stay kind of real and, and, and grounded? Well, and I'm, I, I, I never have a hard time. I don't, I mean, I feel like I've had so much failure in my life yeah. that I, I don't have a hard time staying in there. Because I think, you know, people go, wow, well, I'll this and this and that. I mean, for every 20 things I try, one thing works. Yeah. 
and people probably don't hear about the other 19 things. Yeah. And that's fine by me. I'm not like that's promote them. Yeah. But I don't feel any, you know, you ask how is they real. I don't feel any special, yeah. you know, than anybody else. Yeah. I'm just like trying a lot of stuff, and a lot of it's not working. Yeah. But occasionally, some, you know, you could argue I had one good idea, and that's Trumpist. You know, because really, um, I love my TV. You know, I direct television quite a lot. That's fantastic, and that's a great way to keep directing, and, yeah. and it pays the bills and all that stuff too, which is good. Um, but Trumpist is, you know, let's be honest. Yeah. Like right now, if I get hit by a bus, yeah. Yeah. They're not going to be talking about Siam Sunset. Yeah. Um, nothing against Siam uh -huh. Sunset, but they're just not. Yeah. You know? um, speaking about about failures, there. How do you? How do you? I guess do you embrace failure and, and? I actually do. I think it's a really important part of development. And and when I first started, I don't know where I got this idea from. Whether it was original or I heard it from someone else. But I I started to frame my rejection letters. Yeah. And I still have one. Yeah. And frankly, I got a quite, you know, there was a point there it was getting a bit overwhelming. Yeah. I had to get a bigger office. Um, but like seriously, I have the, I have in my office in New York on the wall a letter I got from Andrew Knight. I don't know, if you, you must know Melbourne, right? Andrew, you know Andrew Knight. Yeah. Right. So he's like so talented and wonderful, and just such a great guy. And he's like, you know, anyway, he he wrote Science Sunset, which was the first feature, I ever. and and. Um, when I asked him, he said it to me as an actor, just like a real short story. And so, and I read it, and I said, I don't think I'm right for this part, but I'm really trying to direct a feature, and I made a couple of shorts. So I wrote to him, it was in the days where you sat down and wrote to people, and stuff, not on email. And I said, how about me to direct it? And he wrote this really, it's like such a kick in the guts, this lady got away. Firstly, he obviously dictated to his secretary, so it's addressed to John Colson. Right? So I was like, oh, this is only going to get worse. And it's just like the worst crushing letter you can ever get. It's like, you know, I hadn't even thought of you. I mean, he wasn't trying to be mean, yeah. but it's a $6 million budget. There's no way I was going to get someone who's done some stuff. you got to read the letter to believe it. And it's like kick in the guts. Up again. And then finally, I think, I think it ends on something like, because I obviously sent him some short film to look at. Yeah. And he says something like, you know, I think I still have your tape around here somewhere. I'm going to try and find some time to watch it, and I may call you. And that's like the end of the letter. Yeah. So anyway, I framed it. And a year later, I directed the film. So that's yeah, yeah. another story. Yeah. Another, you know, after getting kicked in the guts. But, but to answer your question, absolutely. I mean, what's wrong with rejection? You've got to, you know, my policy in those days was, and it still is, you know, if if you want to get into a film festival, let's say, yeah. if you're a filmmaker, which is what I was you know, doing in my late teens and 20s, mm -hmm. i got to get rejected. I've got to go to 100 film festivals. Yeah. And 101 is going to say yes. Yeah. You know? And that's how it is. It's a numbers game. Yeah. And it's the same with Trotfest, with sponsors. I mean, you know, people go, wow, you've got like, Toyota, you've got this, and, you know, Cake Wines, I mean, all these great partners. is like, yeah, you know, you want to see the list of people who have said no to us? Yeah. I mean, it's beyond belief. Yeah. You know, you've just got to, and even now, it's big and all that, but you, you go to places and you, you think there's no way these people are going to say no, and they do say no. Yeah. And that's just part of, part of the process, and you've got to keep going. Yeah. So I guess, I guess a lot of people, you know, a lot of people are quite scared of failure, and I think that's what stops a lot of people from, from doing stuff. So, so you're saying it's just, just, just get out and, and do it? Yeah, I mean, what's the, you know, what's the option? Yeah. Really? I've only ever done anything because I don't have a choice. It's either that or that's Yeah. You know? I mean, the amount of times Tropfus has almost fallen over and I've wanted it to fall over. Yeah. And it's just like, but, but you know, what are we going to do without it? So yeah. let's keep going. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about, you know, when I hear people talking about you, they talk about that you're incredibly well connected and that you've forged these really you know, quite deep and meaningful relationships with people over the past few decades. What would you talk about that and, and about? Yeah, I've heard people say that. I mean, I, <laughs> about, about, de about developing meaningful, meaningful relationships. Well, I do like people. I mean, I, I, I you know, it's I, I do have some of those with sort of connected people. But to be honest, I got I got relations like that with people who've got no value to me at all, mm -hmm. as well. You know, some yeah. of my best friends. And not people are going to do me any good except for they're my best friends and stuff. 
I mean, you know, you, you, I've tried, trust me. I'm like, what use are you unless you can get me a no. I, mean, I don't know, I, I, like, I like people. Yeah. So some of them, and I, you know, I don't know how true that is. Um, I, do, I definitely, I've sort of had this weird connection to some like famous people now. And if you really sat down and analyzed, it's kind of creepy. Like, I, you know, Naomi Watts. I did a film called For Love Alone, which was this unwatchable film, <laughs> where she played an extra. She was my, um, played my girlfriend, you know. So we just sort of, you know, she was 15 or something, and I was 17, and, and, and we're still friends. But she wasn't Naomi Watts, she yeah. was just some, literally an extra. Yeah. Um, you know, Nicole Kidman, when nobody really knew we did Vietnam together. I played her boyfriend, Russell Crowe. Yeah. And I played his boy, and it's like, like everybody I kiss turns into this, except me. <laughs> what am I, Chuck Little over here? You know. So it's like, I'm like, what is that Prince Charming thing? Like, yeah. kiss him and they turn into. Yeah. So what I, I don't know. the last touch. Yeah, well, that's fine. Um, so, you know, you're a family guy, you've got two, two kids? Two daughters. Two daughters. Um, you know, Mary, you're well you know, involved in your community, you're quite well regarded. You know, you seem to be living a, a life, you know, full of integrity, and I, and I want to to talk a little bit about that and who's who along your path have, have kind of inspired you and who have been your kind of mentors and, and heroes. Well, probably my biggest mentor would be George Miller. You know, who's obviously everybody knows an Australian director. He made Mad Max, and, yeah. and he's just a wonderful guy. And he's of all the people on the planet who first heard about Tropist, I'm talking about when it literally was us sitting in the gutter on Victoria yeah. Street. George Miller, of all people, who was already huge. I mean, the guy had made Mad Max. Yeah. You know, um, and was probably in the middle of making Witches of East and stuff. He decided, of all people, this thing's really cool. What is this? And took me under his wing and would have lunch with me every couple of months and just talk to me. And, yeah. You know, and he, again, he had nothing to get out of. Yeah. I mean, I, what was I going to give him? I was just some guy. Yeah. He he produced the thing I mentioned with Nicole Kidman called um, Vietnam. Yeah. So Kennedy Miller at the time. But he just like was just the greatest, and he's still the greatest. So I still hold him very very. You know, I have lunch with him probably once a year. And he's yeah. just the best. He would be the closest thing to a mentor work that I have. I'm not a, like a big mentor guy. Yeah. He's sort of like an accidental mentor. Yeah. Um, you know, I've got a lot of other people I admire for different reasons, but not the whole package. George, I just feel it's like he's, you know, what's better than a successful person who's incredibly, you imagine how much you know, wealth he has and, yeah. you know, and, and what, a, what a world he lives in and he's just such a sweet guy. Yeah. That's what I was for. Um, talking now about, about Tropfest, you know, when you're, you know, I've been to a few of the, the live events and, and there's just such that, there's just that, that sense of kind of, Community. So I want to talk a bit about kind of community and, and cultivating that community and I guess developing that brand over, over kind of 20 years. Yeah. 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 Well, that's like that's I mean, that's a great thing. That's kind of what I think about every day. Yeah. Is is the the whole brand word? I love the brand word. You know, the Tropist is a brand now, and it's a culture and it's important. And we we make little decisions. The guys are here, by the way. We've got the greatest team in the world up the back there. Um, but we make little decisions, and I'll, I'll mention them by name, Grace, Henry, and Michael, who are here, who really are the heart. So I take all the credit, but they, they do all the work. They jump on. But we do, um, we make little decisions 20, 30, 50 times a day yeah. about this brand and what it is. And it's anything from, you know, whether we should charge people to come, which obviously we made that decision years ago, yeah. we should to what brands we associate with, what we do with our filmmakers, what we don't do with our filmmakers. I mean, these are things that I take very, very seriously, yeah. and they matter. You know, we make if we make a wrong decision now, like, you know, it could it could be disastrous. I mean, I don't think the brand would fall over, but we'd be picking up the pieces for months to come. So it's those things about building a culture, yeah. about keeping your focus on, for example. It would be very easy with an event that costs the money, it costs the money we have to raise, to start to think of the sponsors as the most important thing. 
and they're not. I mean, they're really not. They're, we're, they're, we cherish them, they're incredible, but our filmmakers are number one. Yeah. Because without our films and without our content, we're shit. Yeah. I mean, we're basically a bunch of screens in the park yeah. watching YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, seriously, nothing against YouTube, but it's, it's there's no, you know, every it, YouTube knows the problem with YouTube, which is there's no quality control. Yeah. It's like putting a screen up on the planet and hitting play. Like, what does that mean? You need some. So we are number one, first and foremost, without any shadow of a doubt, ever. Yeah. Our filmmakers is what matters yeah. because, and and I think filmmakers know that, yeah. you know, and it's not like we pay them lots of money or stuff. There's a very clear transaction there. Frankly, we get their content for almost nothing, except for all the eyeballs in the world, and they get that. And if they don't want, if they don't want to. That doesn't work for them. They don't have the trough list, but yeah. I think most people want to make things. So you know, it's like these tiny, unique, minute decisions that we make every day, and, and I take them. I mean, I take them incredibly seriously. Um, what do you see as the, you know, in five, ten years' time, the kind of legacy and continuation of of trough fest and that balance of kind of expansion, but still making it feel like a community and. And I guess that's that's always a bit of a, a balance. Yeah, that is a balance. Yeah. yeah. Um, and some would say, you know, we're too commercial. We've we've got it all. But yeah. I think for me, it matters what we think as a team, because no one, we're never going to please everybody. But I think if we've got our hearts in the right place and we're making decisions based on on that, we can't really go wrong. Yeah. Um, but to answer your question, the legacy. I mean, what I want to, what I want to be, you know, partially responsible for is, I guess, the idea that... Because when I started filmmaking, it was like a trust fund thing, you know? You, you weren't a filmmaker unless you came from money, yeah. and unless your parents knew somebody at the film school and got you in. I mean, I applied for the film school year after year after year, with a thousand people, literally, and they took four people. It was never going to be me, you know? It was always like... The, so, not, not that I've got like a chip on my shoulder, but what I'd like to think that Tropis has played part in is the idea that anybody can tell their story now and anybody can use us as a launch pad to a huge career. It's, we're not, you know, I used to say it and kind of hope it, and now it's true. Yeah. I mean, people have come through Tropist and gone into huge things. So um, that's what I want to be part of. I want to, I want to be part of And in a way, that's what's a very Australian event. I mean, it's very egalitarian, it's a level playing field. I, you know, I like to think the idea of it works elsewhere. But <laughs> we're proving now that it does, but I don't think we've started anywhere else except yeah. Australia. Yeah. It's very Australian in that sense, you know. Yeah. That, that we don't. That everyone has has a go. Um, we'll open the the kind of um, questions from the audience in a minute. I just want to ask a, a quick question about Sydney Unplugged. What's what's happening with that? I'm really excited about that. And um, yeah, like, where's where's it at at the moment? Well, Sydney Unplugged. For those you know, it's basically uh, it's like a feature film. That's going to be a series of short segments or stories, whatever you want to call them. We've got some pretty incredible talent attached to it, ranging from Alex Proyas to Ray Lawrence. Russell Crowe um, is directing one, Tony Collette is directing one. We are, you know, we, we, we're probably not quite as advanced as we, and frankly, we, we're going through little legal things at the moment. Yeah. But, um, you know, that's a, come on, we're all, this is a default. Yeah. Um, but so, no, so we're sort of you know crossing the T's and dotting the I's on a couple of yeah. um, matters that have arisen. Nothing yeah. too serious. The normal film business. Yeah. But um, I'm hoping it's off to the races this year for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we you know the scripts are written for most of them. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's scheduling of challenges as always with some of these yeah. um, names. But but I, I'm I'm 100% committed to this thing, and I'm going to make sure. I have it. Um. Has anyone got any questions? We've got a few, a few copies of the, the latest issue of Dumbo Feather on sale this week. Um, so for the first few people to ask questions, you'll get a, a copy of the, the latest issue. Up the front here. So many people are making short films all the time, and it's like the short films are the sick little sister of features. Um, and I was just wondering what you think about short films and their importance. 
in general? Like why yeah. why a short film festival? Is it economic and like more time efficient or do you think that they're genuinely as important? I really do. I mean I hate it when people treat them like stepping stones to features. But there's a few basic facts. I mean you can pretty much not make a living out of short films. I mean that's problem number one. Unfortunately, otherwise everyone would be doing it. Um, but the other thing that, you know, one of the reasons I think shorts are so incredibly important, much more than a stepping stone or whatever, is there is no real commercial restraints. You know, filmmakers can do really whatever they want in shorts. And I don't care if you're, you know, Christopher Nolan, I'm telling you, he's not doing whatever he wants in a feature film. I mean, he's just, this is too much money at stake. And of course, you know, and if he was sitting here, he may beg to differ. And what would I know? But, but I'm, I'm going to take a wild guess and say, if someone's spending 100, 100 million dollars, 100 million, 120 million dollars on your film, it doesn't matter if you're literally God, <laughs> they're going to have a few words to say about how it ends, what the poster looks like, who's in it, how long it is. And I mean, it's just a fact of life, I mean, you know. And, and by the way, he might say, and I'm not picking on any, you know, any, any director might say, well, I have director's cut, and what I'd say is, yeah, but if you use it and the studio doesn't like the end film, why are they going to go and spend another 50 or 70 million dollars promoting it if they don't believe in it? You've got to have those people. But short films is completely immune to all of that problems. I mean, you can do whatever you want. And that's why you'll find these guys, Chris Nolan or you know, James Cameron or Peter Jackson or George Miller, their eyes will light up if you get them talking about their short films, you know, because those were the days where they really, really, really did whatever the hell they wanted and experimented in the truest sense of the word. So, I, you know, obviously I'm biased. You know, someone asked me the other day, I did an interview a couple of nights ago, and the first question was, you know, do short films matter? And my answer was, well, if not, I've just wasted 21 years of my life. <laughs> you know, and the interview was pretty much over. No. Um, so, of course, I'm biased, but I just think from about 20 different you know, angles, short films really are so important. And if I had to choose a world where there was no features versus no shorts, I know what I'd choose. And, and I just think when you sit you know, on Sunday night and you see 16 of these amazing stories, even if you hate half of them, that's still eight incredible movies, you know, and I said bring it on. Great, do we have any more questions? So yeah. can I, oh, uh, sorry. Yep, uh, you ask and then we'll... It sort of leads on from what you're saying, because I know the minute you become commercial and have sponsors and everyone wants to say in what you do, so right. you, are you willing, and I don't know if you've had sponsors go, I demand, are you willing to throw that away and ignore their sponsorship? To get what you want out of it? Yeah, we've never, I can tell you from the bottom of my heart, we have never, ever, 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 ever altered anything at the core of Tropfers over a sponsor. I mean, I'll never forget it was about 98. So imagine Tropfers is five years old. And you've got to understand the history. Like in the early days, the first year or two or three or even four, it would cost me about a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks to put Tropfers to. Go, I'd get my dad's Tarago and I'd rent this square, I'd have to go to North Ride because they were the cheapest and all that, and speakers and stuff like that. And the business model was I spent a thousand bucks, which I didn't really have a lot of money. I might have had two grand in the bank and I'm spending half of it on this you know, silly film night. And then all my friends would go around with buckets, literally, and get, and, and invariably I'd get about 600 bucks back, you know. Um, you know, and then 98 comes along, it was around 98, so we're four years old, the budget's probably, you know, by this point, like 12 grand, and we're sort of scraping it together somehow, and literally, a car company, you know, who shall remain nameless, comes along and says, we want to sponsor you, we have a hundred thousand dollars, I'm not kidding, a hundred grand. And I'm like, I've never heard of that much money. I'm like, wait a minute, there is that much money? Really? And, and they said, now the only catch is, we know you have this like signature item thing, it's got to be our logo. And you can imagine, I'm thinking, yeah, that's fine, let's bring it on. But to my, I'm proud, you know, proud to say, it's time to go and fuck themselves. And we didn't do that, we didn't take the 100 grand. 
but you know, we've been making little decisions like that ever since. I mean, the sponsors don't even, frankly, they don't even really ask, you know. I mean, again, it's 20, 21 years old. The, the, the smart sponsors, they, they kind of, nobody wants to get involved in an event and then change it or change They get why they want to be involved in Tropos in the first place. So, what is that integrity that you're talking about? Starting and sticking. You've got to stick with yeah. it. That's all we've got. I mean, you know, we talk about this all the time. We don't have anything else. You know, if, 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 we, if we sell that or even part of that, then we're just another, I mean, you know, not to mention it, there's other great festivals, don't get me wrong, but this, this festival started by brands and like airlines and, and, and you know what? They start behind the starting line because it's like, wait a minute, this is an ad. You know? This is just an ad. And the great thing about us, we're not advertising really anything. Very so. much. Take one last question. Yeah. Um. It's leading on with that integrity stuff, and how you started off talking about, you know, it's about being true to your story, being true to who you are, and what your vision is. How How do you then cope when you take what's precious and important and integral to who you are, and then you try and take it to the states and you try and do business with people where that's not that they're working on, how, right. how do you kind of go and you want to try to stay true to you but there are people out there who are kind of sharks or are kind of, kind of in it for themselves and for whatever it is that they can get. How, how do you work that kind of stuff and how did you when you first sort of went over there? Well, you know, I find there's good people wherever you go. I mean, so yeah, you want to stay away from those people and Australia in that way is a wonderful place in the film business because it's smaller and you don't really don't find sharks in that way. No one's really out to try and screw you. They might be out to make some money, you know, which is there's nothing wrong with that. But they're not out to. And obviously in America, it's just huge business and big industry. But to be fair, I got lucky when I landed there in about '99. I went and met with some agents who could have just as easily been a bunch of sharks, and I happened to hook up with a couple of great people. You know, people just like people in this room who have American accents and they're agents, but they're great people. You know, so I, I would say you've just got to have your radar on. And and there is, definitely there's a lot of bullshit and there's a lot of shots, but if you look close enough, you're going to find some people with integrity um, and you try and work with them, I guess, and stick with them. And, and you know, and then just try and avoid or the others along the way. I mean, again, you don't really have that problem here as much because it's just, you know, somebody said recently, the nicest possible way, the great thing about the Australian film industry is they haven't figured out it's a business. You know? <laughs> <laughs> An American said that to me. And it's sort of, in a way, incredibly patronising. But on the other hand, it's very true. I mean, I worked on a big American production that was shooting in town years ago. And these people were just giving 150%, not because they wanted their oversight of them, because they're just good people and they want to do a great job, you know. And that is the great thing about the Australian film industry. I suppose when you go to America, you do have to have your wits about you. And But I, listen, I've been there for 12 years. I, I mean, I am, I'm more New York than most New Yorkers now. I, feel, I have to sort of shut myself down, because you do put up this wall and, like, you know, the whole like walking and almost getting hit by a car. Fuck you, no fuck you. All that stuff. <laughs> you know, you can't help it. Um, so, what are you gonna do? Amazing. Well, um, thank you so much, John. I imagine this week is an extremely busy week every year. We really this appreciate you giving is... up, giving up, uh, you know, your time. Thanks, Brian. Mm -hmm. It's been great. Appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah.